We have with us Martin Griffiths, who's the UN Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator. Joining us here in the studio, Mr. Griffiths, welcome to Al Jazeera. Good to Thank see you, you very again. Much. So I took a look at your latest numbers out of Ocha, and according to the latest update you've provided, you say that 1.1 million people are facing catastrophic levels of food insecurity in Gaza. There are 1.7 million IDPs, 17,000 children are unaccompanied or separated. I mean, you're in charge of coordinating humanitarian efforts at the UN around the world. Have you ever seen anything like this? I don't think so. And the telling symptom of that for me is that when very, very experienced humanitarian aid workers who've been in all kinds of places around the world for decades, when they go to Gaza to help, to serve, to work, it is traumatizing for them. So God help what it must be for the people of Gaza. It is really, really difficult and it's getting worse daily. Yeah, in December, you had said that ap apocalyptic conditions in the south of the Strip are blocking aid and ending any meaningful humanitarian operations. It's now five months later, mm -hmm. and the Israelis have launched a military offensive in Rafah, and they've also uh, taken control of that border crossing, cutting off one of the most vital entry routes for aid into Gaza. So what has this meant for the already dire humanitarian situation? The predictions that many of us made, um, the worries that we had about a Rafa operation seem to be coming true. And that's a huge tragedy. 800,000 people displaced in the last 10, 12 days. It's a shocking, shocking reflection. People who've been displaced more than three or four times already, many of them, no place to go, no uh, food to eat. We are stuck in the south in terms of the operation because we don't have fuel and the trucks as you say are not getting through because the crossing points are, are blocked and so at the moment we have very little to offer the people of gaza and what the message of course from all humanitarian agencies is open those crossings it's that simple are you speaking to the Israelis on opening up these land routes? And if so, what are they telling you? I mean, we've seen, we were showing the pictures a moment ago of some humanitarian aid has now begun arriving via that U.S. sponsored yeah. pier uh, off the coast of Gaza. But your office has said that this should not be a substitute for getting aid through land crossings. No, and, and tragically, the 15 trucks, I think, which uh, took aid away from the beach from the maritime operation yesterday, only four of those trucks managed to get through more or less untouched to the warehouse. So it's the problems in Gaza that really, and always we have said, uh, are, are the problem, the security of distribution. We have also said, keep land at crossings open. We, we welcome the maritime pier. It's good to have trucks coming in. We welcome the Israelis opening Eretz up in the north, but it ain't enough. We meet with the Israelis daily through COGAT, the, the committee set up for this purpose. Um, we have many, many detailed discussions with them about security, about the movement of our trucks and convoys, about the priorities for fuel. But the fact of the matter is, and everybody will tell you this is not conjecture, is we are not in a position to provide proper aid to the people of Gaza right now. It's not ever been quite as difficult as it is today. Are the Israelis then breaking international law considering We've seen UN Security Council resolutions being passed, uh, calling uh, for the delivery of aid. We've seen, of course, the ICJ rulings on provisional measures also demanding more aid allowed in. And these are all binding uh, by international law. I'm very careful about assigning blame because I'm not a judge. My job is to get aid to people who need it. Uh, there are other people who are judges. You listen to my colleague, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, you listen to the International Committee of the Red Cross and they will give you very clear views. You listen to my colleague Tedros, the head of the World Health Organization, about the attacks on health institutions. Okay, let me rephrase then. Do you think that Israel is allowing uh, all the aid in that it can? No, okay. it can do much better. And it's not as if that hasn't been pointed out by us, of course, but by other governments, the US has made that clear. Much more can be done, much more can be done. And ideally, and obviously, and hopefully, this operation needs to stop. Are the Americans putting enough pressure on the Israelis to open up more land routes? Yeah. And, uh, and also, why do you think that the Americans went down uh, the route of uh, 
sort of inaugurating and opening up this pier off the coast of Gaza? Well, I think the pier is, a, is another option, which is good. The more options, the better to get aid in. And that's true in every, any, anywhere in the world. But I guess they aren't succeeding in their advocacy with the Israelis to get the crossings open because the crossings are closed and are not letting aid in. And now there's evacuation orders in the north, which makes the access to the north difficult. So that's why I'm saying it's a daily deterioration in the circumstances and context that we operate in. And that's before we even talk about the trauma that your correspondents live every day and that you report so completely. The trauma of people there, never mind whether they get food or not, that is surely the key human problem here and the absence of hope. What about the targeting, uh, some would describe as the targeting of UN facilities, uh, particularly UNRWA, and these are, according to their latest figures, 193 of their facilities have been damaged. Uh, I beg your pardon, 171 of their facilities, and there have been 193 UN workers, as you know, who have been killed in this war in Gaza. Why isn't the UN able to put an end to what looks like, what's described by many, as disregard of UN facilities and UN workers in Gaza by Israel? i am been in this business for about 50 years and I've never seen quite the impunity that we see, not just in Gaza, but across the world today, for those who decide violence is the best way of resolving differences, whether it's in Gaza or Sudan or elsewhere. Impunity is there because people get away with breaking the law, the international law. And I agree with Philippe Lazzarini of UNRWA when he says we need to get inquiries into those killings, those attacks, those attacks on your own premises. We shouldn't let that go unmonitored and lacking in effective advocacy. Impunity stops when we raise our voices. Have the voices been raised loud enough? Well, I th you know, we, we speak daily. Uh, my, as I mentioned earlier, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the Secretary General, Nobody could say they haven't raised their voices. Whether they're heard, and certainly whether they're acted on, that's another question. Uh, I'd like to ask your uh, take on sort of uh, any ceasefire, potential for a ceasefire, because we've heard top officials from the UN repeatedly call for a ceasefire, yet we see the US blocking ceasefire resolutions at the UN Security Council, and we also see uh, the US continuing to supply Israel uh, with weapons. Do you think that there's any other route to stop the fighting, in your opinion? I think you've got to keep, keep at it. I mean, I'm, I'm here in, in, in Doha. Qatar has played an amazing role with the, their role in the mediation to get that ceasefire, to get the hostages out, to stop the, the terrible toll on the people of Gaza. You don't stop, you keep at it. And I know this from many, many other conflicts. Just because you don't get the right answer the first time doesn't mean to say you keep at it, you don't stop. And yes, absolutely the ceasefire is the still current option that needs to be held. Uh, you were mentioning Sudan a moment ago. If we can just shift our focus to, Su mm. to Sudan. So obviously your job is to deal with uh, all the humanitarian emergencies right around the world. Do you think that Sudan has been overshadowed with, uh, with events out of Gaza and the world's attention really focused on Gaza? Yes, I do. I really do. The bandwidth, which is available for international attention, and of course you, you know it from your own business, is very, is very focused, and it's rightly focused on Gaza. Uh, it's a horror, as we have just been discussing. But Sudan, five million people at risk of famine in, Ga in, in Sudan. The planting season is about to end. Access is routinely denied. The fighting for al-Fasha is a huge worry. Um, there are claims there of ethnic cleansing and, and so on. And we are not getting the kind of cooperation that we need from the parties to deliver. And we're not getting the funding that we need that we would have to have if we were able to deliver. I'm deeply ashamed by the way in which the absence of focus on Sudan tells a story about humanity today. What are you calling for when it comes to Sudan in particular? First of all, a ceasefire in El Fasha to stop an attack which will target also civilians, collateral damage, if you like. Secondly, absolute clarity about the, in, the obligations that the parties have for access. I hope Jeddah gets moving again, as we have heard. 
The two parties signed the Jeddah Declaration back in the early Jeddah process. I was there. Uh, I would like them to reread those documents and stick to those promises, because at the moment we're not seeing it. Uh, Mr. Griffiths, you've obviously worked in uh, the UN in many jobs over the years, but this is your last month in this particular posting. Mm. Looking back, would you have done anything differently? Well, that's a good question. I wasn't expecting that one. Um, I would have hoped that more attention could be paid, especially now the world we see, the world of impunity, the world of war, more attention could be paid for accountability to, uh, to promises made. I would have liked to have seen, including by me, more attention paid to those norms that we were able to succeed in creating over those decades and have now been tossed aside. I would like to have seen us able to create uh, forces which could instantly be deployed to keep the peace instead of long uh, delays in making that happen. I'd like to see a world we all would for our children, which is better than the one we brought to bear. All right, Martin Griffiths, uh, the UN Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for speaking to Al Jazeera. Thank you very much. Make sure to subscribe to our channel to get the latest news from Al Jazeera.